Rob Atkinson, president of ITIF. And, uh, I feel like I should announce who the next commissioner is going to be today. You know? <laughs> the White House called me and told me who it is, and they said, we can announce it here today. <laughs> uh, in any case, I'm not going to do that. But we've we got the next best thing, which is a panel of really great experts to talk about what the next commissioner and uh, the next FCC should be thinking about. Uh, and, you know, I think it's interesting, FCC issues are, are, are somewhat cyclical. Uh, they they kind of get hot for a while, they kind of go down a little bit. And I think they're now coming back to the hot phase in the sense of you know, a lot of critical issues that have to be addressed by the FCC over the next year or two. And that's really what this panel is going to talk about today. I'm going to introduce people very, very quickly. And the format's going to be a little different. We're just going to go ask folks to just sort of give their top five or six or three <coughs> items that they think are critical. And then we're going to come back to everybody and go through each item, uh, the major items, uh, one at a time and get dialogue on exactly how the FCC should approach that. Uh, and then we'll open it up and have plenty of time for questions and we'll adjourn no later than 10.30. Uh, I'll start. Um, um, so, uh, Rick Chesson, Senior Vice President, Law and Regulatory Affairs at uh, NCTA, National Cable Communication Association. Uh, I'm not going to go through long bios, so Rick joined NCTA in 2009. Uh, he previously had served uh, several roles at the FCC. Um, Randy May was sick, but then said he's coming, so Randy may just be a few minutes later. <coughs> Uh, let me introduce him anyway. Uh, he's Vice President of the Free State Foundation, which is an independent, pro-market uh, oriented uh, think tank. And he was uh, also uh, with the FCC Assistant General Counsel uh, and Associate General Counsel in the late 1970s. Blair Levin uh, needs no introduction. Uh, Blair uh, is currently at the Aspen Institute. He led the uh, broadband plan for the, uh, for the FCC uh, right after uh, Chairman Jankowski came in and um, uh, was prior to that, uh, was a chief staff for Reed Hunt in the uh, uh, first year home for all of Reed Hunt's term as FCC chairman. Uh, Gigi Sohn, again, needs no introduction, chairman, uh, founder, and uh, president of Public Knowledge, which is a, a think tank that focuses on communications policy to promote openness and democratic principles and values. She's also a senior fellow at Silicon Flatirons and uh, is the uh, co-chair of the uh, Broadband Internet Technology Advisory Group, and um, uh, Chris uh, Gutman McCabe was going to join us. Unfortunately, he thought that testifying on the Hill was more important for some reason uh, and uh, was not able to join us. But we uh, have, are in good stead with uh, his colleague, Scott Bergman, who is assistant, assistant uh, for regulatory policy at, uh, at CTIA. And then Richard Bennett has joined us uh, through the Magic of Skype. Richard is a uh, senior fellow at, uh, senior research fellow at ITIF, leads ITIF's telecom policy work, uh, and has 30 years background in network engineering. Uh, so I think uh, hopefully um, Randy will join us. We'll do this. go down the line and then start with Rick. Okay. Uh, good morning, and thanks for uh, inviting me, Rob. Uh, my list is probably somewhat shorter than some other lists. Uh, my colleagues here. Uh, things I would like the FCC to focus on over the next year or so, uh, let me just throw out three of them. The first would be spectrum, uh, particularly finding additional spectrum for unlicensed Wi-Fi use. Uh, Cable is just rolling out one of the largest Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi networks in the world, and uh, unfortunately with the current Wi-Fi becoming congested, and we need to find additional spectrum, particularly for next generation of Wi-Fi. Second would be a universal service and really uh, adhering to the idea of reform uh, laid out originally in the broadband plan and refocusing on technological and competitive neutrality, making sure that that's where the fund goes so the most efficient providers can actually get the money. And the third would be uh, broadband adoption and trying to move the needle in that area where, uh, as everybody knows, deployment is well into the 90s. Uh, but adoption of Portland frequently is still south of uh, 70 percent, uh, and we can move the needle there. So that's my list. That was great. Blair, can you top that? Um, <laughs> uh, I'll try that. Uh, though I agree with all of those. 
Um, so I have four buckets. Uh, first, the obvious, they have to do the incentive auction and they have to do the IT transition. Second, cleanup. Um, there's going to be cleanup required, I believe, in terms of the open internet order after the court rules. Uh, second, USF. Um, I agree with what Rick said. I would also add they have to do the con they have to reform the contribution factor. Um, there's something coming down the line, which which I think of as the impact of LTE on the RUS loans that will require some FCC action. Um, and and they're also they haven't addressed the question of what happens when you have institutions that need much bigger bandwidth. Senator Rockefeller talked about this in terms of getting a gig to the schools. Uh, the FCC is going to have to address that. Uh, that was not done in the 2011 order. Uh, well, just to clarify on that, what sure. you're talking uh, in, in the context of uh, high cost and unserved areas. Well, actually, in terms of the uh, higher speeds, uh, there's really two things. One is institutions like schools need higher speeds. The second is what's going to happen in rural areas is LTE will cause cord cutting, which will undercut the existing economics of the wireline provider. Um, to a certain extent, as Rick said, it's competitive neutrality, that's good. But the problem is what happens to um, the police station, the schools, the hospital, when the wireline provider, which has been spreading the cost among a lot of other folks, uh, loses some of the residential business. And that's a tricky problem that hasn't been even thought about. Uh, the third cleanup item is Spectrum. Uh, I certainly agree with Rick, the unlicensed sharing agenda is very important. And secondly, the, the, the unfortunate light squared incident suggests that we really have to do something about receiver standards. Um, the third bucket is that FCC has to decide whether it's serious or it's just engaged in um, what might be thought of better done by um, uh, foundations, that is to say voluntary efforts. Uh, on adoption, um, I certainly commend all the private sector folks who have done voluntary stuff. But to me, that's like a really big problem, and the government ought to be far more focused and serious about it. Uh, and the second is, of course, the thing that I work on most of the time, which is how do we get a critical mass of communities with world-leading networks? I would just note a significant difference between what Arne Duncan did with his race to the top for education and the current FCC approach of saying we would like it if something happened, but not putting any thought or effort or capital uh, into having to give it networks. And then finally, I would just know, I think, there's an, I think there's an existential question, which is why do we have an FCC that hopefully the chair will address. And that's both a question of commission, uh, but it's also a question of how you do it. And I, I certainly think one of the things I would put on the next chair's agenda was the FCC really has to establish itself as an expert agency. <coughs> And, you know, in the same way like the Bureau of Labor Statistics or others have a certain kind of level of expertise where whether you agree or not with kind of the overall direction, there is a providing to the public a clear-eyed, um, full-throated um, level of understanding about what's going on in the United States and in the world so that policymakers at the federal, state, and local level can, uh, can at least rely on that information. Great, thank you. Gigi. So I've got... That green light. There you go, Malico. There you go. Okay. So I've got yeah. So I've got three substantive issues, and this is I mean I'm not going to discuss USF, which clearly is important. I'm just talking about where the FCC's priorities might merge with public knowledge's priorities, and I agree with uh, both my colleagues to my right. I do think uh, the most important issue in front of this, this next FCC, and frankly one of the most important communications issues of the past 10 years is this transition from TEM copper networks to all IP networks and what are the values that are going to underlie those networks and I think I mean this this implicates everything I mean you know this implicates service to all Americans public safety reliability I mean it's just a, a critical issue and you know the, the question has already been joined in front of the FCC you know what is going to be your role as we as we port over to all IP networks, and I, I think it's like I said, one of the most important questions that's been before the agency in the past ten years. Second is spectrum, and there's so many issues here. Not only the incentive auctions, but also concentration. The Department of Justice made a very powerful filing uh, last week at the FCC asking it to watch out how much. Uh, about how much spectrum it puts in one hands, or one party's hands, or two parties' hands. 
the license versus license, very critical, and also what to do about government spectrum. How to try to arrest government uh, spectrum out of the cold dead hands of government agencies that don't want to use it up. And then the third substantive issue from a public knowledge <coughs> perspective is what can the FCC do to help fix the broken video market? Uh, there are certainly ways that it can reform retransmission consent. We actually think it has border authority that it thinks, or the current FCC thinks it has to fix uh, the wildly you know, out of control retransmission consent fees. There are protectionist regulations, particularly for broadcasters, that really need to go in the dumpster. This is where I become a you know, right wing deregulator. Things like distance signal protection, sports blackout rule. Why do we need those anymore? And all they do is serve to protect incumbents. Now, obviously, the courts are looking at things like area, which I think is a game changer uh, and could get us more to the place where we want to be, which is where the public can view the television, the video they want to view, anytime, any place, on any device. And that is our goal. Uh, and unfortunately, our regulatory structure prevents a lot of that from happening, and the FCC has a role in making that uh, that system more competitive, more technologically neutral. Uh, also in this space is I think the FCC has things it could do to help ensure that the online video market uh, is robust. It's robust, but it can be more robust. We have concerns about data caps and other any competitive activities that keep online video as being sort of the core sister, and we hope the FCC will do something about that as well. Finally, and this really kind of tacks on to what Blair said, I think the Commission has got to restore faith in itself and in its processes, and as Blair said, you know, has to answer the question, why do we have an FCC? There are a lot of folks out there saying we don't need an FCC, the FTC can take care of 95% of the problems. Uh, I don't believe that is the case. On the other hand, I think the FCC is a broken agency uh, and again needs to restore the public's faith in that it really is a transparent uh, agency and also that it will enforce its rules. I think that's perhaps our biggest gripe. Everybody complains about the FCC being, you know, oh, all these rules are there, you know, horrible and you know no certainty and blah 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 who cares they don't enforce the rules so I think the FCC needs to figure out what it is what it's going to be in the future and how it can restore the public's faith in the public does great thank you uh, just been joined by Randy May thank you Randy um, apologies no worries I'm going to go next to Richard <laughs> And I think a big issue with Nikki on that a little bit, it's not the most important issue in the last 10 years. I think it's probably the most important issue the SEC has ever faced. It's essentially for the industry So there are lots of parts to the IP transition. There's the phase out of the free all telecom service, the complete overhaul of the universal service fund and re-examination of the whole concept of universal service, but it really makes sense. They have a one kind of city resident subsidizing uh, telephone service on uh, Aspen ski lodges. Uh, and this implicates an entire philosophical framework for the public interest and the, and the enhancement of network externalities as we uh, build this new network. And new public interest uh, concept around it. The old field has, uh, that the home company had a guaranteed profit and a monopoly to uh, the areas in which it could make tons of money and in return for that they subsidized serves in rural areas and that that deal may not be the way that we want to go forward uh, with, with IP. Um, Obviously, there are going to be subcommittees in areas that are expensive to serve, and they're just, but we do want to have market competition where, where the uh, population density will support it. So, in some sense, I think you probably need to start with a blank slate and figure out which obligations and which regulations make sense and enhance the goals that we're going to establish for uh, a universal IP network. IP transition is often, I think, confused with fiberization. Uh, people say it's the transition away from the copper telephone network to the fiber IP network. 
fiber and IP are, are actually distinct, obviously, because you're doing IP over wireless. But with uh, nearly 20 million miles of fiber going into the U.S. every right year, it's not clear that there's a problem with fiber. People tend to focus, I think, a little bit too much on fiber to the premise without realizing that that's sort of the icing and cake is really the, the fiber backhaul and, and middle mile. Spectrum reassignment and uh, the, the policy framework around spectrum, I think, is the second issue of almost equally with uh, the IP transition. That includes repurposing the government spectrum, the structure the right once between licensed and unlicensed, figuring out you know, what level of sharing is really appropriate. And PCAS report was sort of aspirational in that regard. It presumes some technologies that don't actually exist. Obviously, the incentive auction, the nature of the rights to TV broadcast, uh, there seems to be the buried in the notion of the transmission consent and that broadcasters who give up their over-the-air factor are going to lose out when it comes to the, the profitability of their retransmission deals with cable companies, and we don't want that to be a barrier. Uh, we wrote a, a report on the spectrum uh, last year that, that essentially pointed to some policy algorithms that can be used to help make some of these reassignment uh, decisions, and so I, I commend people to, to read that spectrum policy for innovation. Uh, broadband adoption is obviously an issue of lesser importance, but the FCC has a big role to play there in terms of the voting pulpit. I uh, should establish a goal of 95% usage of IP at mobile. Um, <coughs> that's, a, that's an interesting problem that is primarily, I think, going to come down to public-private partnerships. The development of low-cost devices, the, in, the enhancement of computer ownership, whatever computer means these days. Some old issues that need to be cleaned up are the uh, net neutrality regulations, where the FCC actually has the authority. Congress would grant that authority to, to the FCC explicitly. It doesn't indicate the indications are right now that this Congress probably wouldn't be willing to do that. Media ownership restrictions, I think, is kind of a, uh, an issue that get long in the tooth. With the uh, mm -hmm. time price of journalism, there certainly couldn't be any, any institutional barriers to the development of multi platform content delivery by a newspaper, TV, radio, and internet of, uh, of a prison and to a lesser extent entertainment. This probably implies uh, this list of uh, uh, early probably implies the development of the New Communications Act, certainly a new title uh, to cover universal IP. Uh, it's a scary issue that, that people have been kind of backing away from for the last five years, but sooner or later it will have to be addressed and the FCC is going to have to contribute to that, although they don't get to define their own mission, but they certainly will be involved. And uh, FCC process is going to need uh, an overhaul because I think the very mission of the FCC is going to be significantly changed in a competitive IP and, and mobile world. That was when the FCC was when the original Communications Act in 1934 and the FCC was created. So I, I'd echo what Blair said in terms of the, uh, the requirement for the FCC to actually stand out as an expert in these areas. It was really kind of unfortunate, I think, that the DOJ's statement on effective uh, concentration was largely a uh, little bit of a technical view of the Justice Department about this beachfront spectrum notion. Judgments like that shouldn't be coming from the Justice Department. That should be coming from the expert, uh, which clearly uh, on the technical side of this, the DOJ is not. So that should be enough to uh, for a while. Great, thank you. Uh, Randy, you missed sort of the intro, which is right now we're just five minutes putting our issues on the table, uh, assemble them, and then we'll come back. So, uh, make sure you press the button. You gotta hold it down one second. Uh, thank you, and my apologies again for being late. And uh, as uh, myself imposed punishment for that, I, I could even try and do this in less than five minutes because
was uh, following Richard, uh, a lot of what he said, uh, I tend to agree with, and uh, probably some of the others as well, maybe less with my friend Gigi here, but, <laughs> but we'll, maybe we'll get, we'll get into that. But let me just, so I'll just highlight uh, a couple of things. You know, when I gave Rob a list of <coughs> Priorities. I, I put it that my top two on the, the list that I, I gave him uh, were implementing the incentive auctions and repurposing government uh, spectrum uh, and uh, getting the IP transition trials uh, started and, and moving moving those along. And I mean the reasons why I think those are uh, at the top of the list. I think just echo what, what Richard uh, said. It seems to me like those right at the moment are the, you know, and for really the uh, foreseeable future are the two most important things that the FCC uh, should be doing. And they're not uh, topics or issues that are without uh, complications. They're not uh, simple. You know, even people like myself sometimes see things more sim simplistically uh, uh, than maybe they are. But recognize that these are uh, complex issues, but I think important. But I want to pick up on <coughs> one of the uh, something that Richard uh, said that was actually on my list uh, as well, and didn't think others would necessarily talk about. Uh, he talked about the FCC having a bully open uh, and in some sense starting, I think, the uh, IP transition with a, a blank slate. Uh, the way that I phrased it actually when I, when I wrote with Rob in, in terms of priority was actively educating Congress and the public as to the need for a new Communications Act uh, that is radically different than the present one. I, mean, I, I do see the FCC, uh, and really the FCC chairman, but the other commissioners as well, uh, as uh, being able uh, to be in a position, and in fact having an obligation, really, to explain uh, Congress and, and to the public why we we need a new act, and why the current act with its smokestack. list that will probably come up with a list that will 
um, take the commission the full 2013 um, to solve. But my um, my list would start with spectrum, spectrum, and spectrum. And you know, if you think I'm being cheeky about you know listing the same thing three times, um, there really are that many issues out there in the spectrum space, and and they're that important. I mean, if, if I were back to my FCC days, if I were advising a new chair on what I would do with 2013, and you're looking for real tangible ways that you can increase investment, increase innovation, and reach folks at a very personal level, it's trying to continue to fuel the mobile revolution that we're seeing right now. Um, you know, all of you spend a lot of time in, in Washington, D.C., and you know that there's not a lot that folks can agree on in Washington, D.C., but one thing that folks were able to agree on last year was you need to bring more spectrum to the market. So implementing the incentive auctions uh, provisions of the act would be my spectrum number one. Um, a couple of panels mentioned uh, the need to um, work with NTIA to free up government spectrum. That would certainly be my spectrum number two. Um, in the Spectrum Act, we have uh, a mandate that the FCC auction the AWS3 spectrum, so 25 megahertz of a really critical spectrum for the industry. And there's a natural pairing that's out there. It's 25 megahertz of a government spectrum that's been identified, that's been looked at for a number of years. Um, so pushing that across the goal line and making sure that we can bring those two blocks of spectrum together is critically important. Uh, and then my third spectrum will sort of be a catch-all. There are a number of issues that the folks brought up along the way, but uh, the FCC is re required to identify 15 megahertz of spectrum. NCIA has been required to identify 15 megahertz of spectrum. Those, those two blocks can be naturally paired up. There's the H block, there are a variety of other issues that are out there, so that would make spectrum. Um, I one, two, and three, if I had to toss in just a couple of others, I would agree with everyone else, I think, who said the IP transition is, is, a, is a big issue. Um, yeah, I think the FCC can you know, choose to avoid it, um, or they can choose to act and take some steps to try to um, set themselves on a course to developing a framework that matches the services and the market that's out there. But the IP transition is coming one way or the other, whether the FCC acts or not. Um, these services are being rolled out. So um, maybe two others that are sort of nuts and bolts questions, less philosophical, but if I were thinking about 20, and I, this is really me focusing on 2013, things that could be done. The FCC proposed uh, a series of broadband infrastructure acceleration initiatives. And these really are nuts and bolts things like model tower site rules. Um, CTIA has a petition to help speed up the deployment of temporary towers. So if you're gonna have big events, like an inauguration or a marathon or you know these other things, you could bring in capacity more quickly. Um, these are very common sense, not particularly controversial proposals that could really speed up the deployment of mobile broadband. Um, and then I pick up, I think Blair, maybe a couple other folks mentioned universal service, right, as well to continuing the implementation, certainly you know, Chris is up there testifying about the Lifeline program today. A perfect project for this FCC in 2013 is finishing the reforms that the FCC adopted in the Lifeline program. So adopting um, databases to make sure that there are not duplicate subscriptions in the Lifeline program. Developing automated means to have eligible <coughs> income customers plugged into the program. So that the program reaches the intended beneficiaries but is also as strong as possible. Stop there. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, you know, it, 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 you look at this list, and it's pretty clear the FCC's got a gigantic set of things that they could be working on, and, and, and to some extent are. Um, and, and each one of these, we could go in, we could do a whole panel on every single one of these, and, and do a whole day, in fact. And obviously, we don't have time to do that. But I want to start with this more process-oriented question we talked to. A number of panelists talked about the ability of the FCC to do these things, uh, how they do it, uh, as well as perhaps needing different authority under perhaps a new title. Uh, so I want to start with Blair and say, you know, Blair, in a way what we need, I mean, obviously the FCC is because it's a, it's a sort of progressive era entity with these five commissioners, and it's sometimes hard to get consensus on things, a little different than the NTIA. Uh, is the FCC capable of doing these sorts of things in a timely and effective way? Um, 
I think it has legal powers to do so. I just think it's a question of whether it chooses to do it. In the 96 Act, Congress gave us 110 rulemakings to do in 18 months. I think, I think my numbers are right. The, the, the large bulk of them had to be done, done in six months. Um, we got everyone done. Uh, we had overtime utility bills of $500,000 per month um, because of the overtime that people worked, but we got it done. Now, actually, it was, it was useful to have Congress give us deadlines. I, I hated it at the time, but I, in retrospect, thought it was very, very valuable. So um, I just think it, it all depends on whether the agency is mission driven. And I, I just might note, Randy um, and a number of colleagues wrote a letter to the president suggesting that the prime criteria for the next chair should be humility. Excuse me, oh, did you did correct you the record? I, oh. I didn't write that letter or sign it. Or... Oh, is that right? I'm yeah. sorry. I, should, I apologize. It's it's not not some, I, some common... It's not that I disagree with... Uh, <laughs> it was a long time. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I didn't I'm not I just want to be clear about that. Then, uh, then I'll, I'll speak to other conservatives who are not here. <laughs> uh, having worked for a chairman, whose prime characteristic was not humility, <laughs> but who nonetheless I thought was quite successful. And the reason I think he was successful was he was mission group. And I actually, I, I do think there is an important quality to character and leadership, and that part of the letter I agree with. I even think humility is a good quality in a human being. Uh, but I think that, you know, the FCC absolutely can do these things. It's a question is, is that what the chairman is getting up in the morning thinking about? And is that what he's going to bed? And does he or she? Or she, thank you. Um, uh, does does she really focus her attention on telling people? Uh, I'll just tell you a very quick story. The day after the bill, the 96 Act passed, we gave a speech and said, in which he said, "We're going to meet or beat every deadline Congress gave us." And I said, "That's a horrible. Why did you do that? Because we'll never, it'll never happen." He said, "No, it will happen, and you will make it happen." <laughs> that's the kind of leader. That's what it takes. And uh, if you have a leader who does that, yeah, they can do it. It's like Pat Riley saying they were going to three p. Uh, right. That statement of all the Lakers were on the sound like what you said. Yeah, yeah. We have to set the expectation correctly. Yeah, I mean, my my advice to the next FCC chair, whoever he or she may be, is that in the first thirty days you have to tell, you have to give a major speech, telling the American public what you stand for and what your agenda is. You know what your principles are, what values underlie what you want to do and set out an agenda. Michael Powell did that very well. Bill Kennard did that very well. Reed Hunt did that very well. The last several chairs have not done that. And I, I couldn't actually t tell you what the last several chairs believed in. Uh, and I think it's really, really critical that that person say, this is what I believe in and this is what I'm going to do. And everything else flows from there. Instead of letting industry or anybody else, any other stakeholders set the agenda. Well, Rick and that's Scott. Okay, just two quick points. First, uh, I think being a mission-driven FCC chair does not necessarily mean being a regulatory FCC chair. Uh, Bill Kennard was the one who you know, initially started the light touch regulatory approach for broadband, which was a conscious decision not to regulate. That was the best thing that the government could do in that situation was recognize the private sector was the best way to roll out the kind of broadband economy that we have today that Julius Janikowski just, I think a couple of weeks ago, characterized as vibrant and pointed out how we're leading the world in both infrastructure and innovation. So I think that, that you wouldn't necessarily equate those two. The other point I think is I agree with Blair about the um, the value of having the SEC be an expert agency and putting reports out that over the last few years have kind of slipped up a little bit on this, putting out the kinds of data that the public debates are really informed by. I mean, you know, the old saying that everybody's entitled to their own opinion but not their own set of facts. It's helpful, and now we rely on Pew and others, but it'd be good to have the FCC again on a regular basis to put out a common set of facts that we then can have the debate about, and that is a function of the FCC concern. Uh, Scott, you So thanks. I, I just wanted to say a word about deadlines and, and about commitments, and this is a little bit of a tip of the hat to Blair, but one of the things that uh, the last commission did with the National Broadband Plan was to articulate two really key goals with deadlines. The first was to bring 300 megahertz of spectrum to market for mobile wireless services within five years. And the second was to bring 500 megahertz of spectrum to market for mobile and fixed services within 10 years. And that's an incredibly important commitment, one that um, has enjoyed wide bipartisan support and is something that this commission can continue to work on. 
Um, and next to see Congress, when they pass the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act, set some explicit deadlines. So the commission is working under deadlines to um, not only auction, but um, assign uh, licenses for um, significant infusion of spectrum by February of 2015. And we're awfully glad that those deadlines are out there. Um, you know, some deadlines in the federal government space might be helpful as well, too, as we try to you know, match that spectrum up, as I mentioned. I'll get it uh, shortly. Uh, and Blair, uh, despite the fact that I didn't sign that letter, I agree with a lot. I agree with part of it. I do agree with uh, what you said about leadership and character and humility. And uh, I, I think what Rick said uh, is very important. And I would, about regulation and the approach, I would just say uh, that it, it would be really important in a new chair, uh, and this goes with the humility uh, aspect of, of his or her character, to have a sense that, that uh, the commission can't micromanage uh, markets that the regulatory mindset needs to be changed. But I, I want to really delve down to a, a deeper level on the process with the Rob really asked about the commission's process. And, and this will, this is a point that I made in the past, and uh, maybe it's not going to change soon, but I do think it's affected the way the commission operates now versus and the, its ability to reach decisions more quickly versus the way it did back when I was there a long time ago, or maybe even when Blair was there. And that's, I think, the ex parte process and the way the commission sort of car allow, carries it out or allows it to, uh, to occur, delays its ability to make decisions more quickly because the initial comments and reply comments, I think it would come, they're not seen as being nearly as important. And I, and I know a lot of my friends in the industry, every, everyone, because everyone does ex parte's and everyone everyone asks, feels like they have to do them. And, and there's a role, there's a, obviously an important role for them because things can change after you write your comments. But I, just my observation is it's made it because everyone understands that you can keep up the process longer by doing this and then it, there's the response and sort of, I think it's made it more difficult for the commission to reach decisions on a more timely basis in a, you know, in an area that all of us, everyone in this room would agree because of the changes in the marketplace and technology. It's important that we should be able to do that. So that's, that's one small, that's one maybe important thing I'd like to see somehow people think about how to change it. Everybody agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I just think the process goes on way too long. Even though there was some minor ex parte reform, I still think that the, the, the notices are opaque. I mean, we've even recommended having ex parte meetings either be videotaped or have some third party uh, sort of rapporteur write what was in there. But I think, but I, I take your initial point. I mean, the commissioners can at a certain point just stop taking meetings. And these sort of last minute, huge substantive filings where there's almost no opportunity to reply, I think are just an abuse of the process. I also, we've agreed with uh, Sunshine Act reform as well. Uh, you know, the fact that you can't have three commissioners in a room, that a lot of the dealing is done with staff, I think that needs to be fixed as well. And I think the bills that have been introduced have been, have been good. I also agree. Um, I think the, the office of what's OSP, yeah. what was the standard of OSP? Strategic Planning, yeah, it used to be OPP, uh, has really been, I think it's kind of become decrepit. I think there should be an academic advisory board where you get people from outside the Beltway helping with data and helping with you know reports and things like that. Uh, I think there needs to be some real leadership. The FCC needs to have a think tank. The FCC needs to develop its own data. Obviously, it's somewhat constrained by resources, uh, but I think it's important to get to revivify that office again. And then um, I think the FCC should rely more on multi-stakeholder processes. I mean, it shouldn't be the be-all, end-all. I think the BTAG, uh, I mean, this is self-serving since I'm the co-chair, 
but I think it works quite well uh, to inform the Commission on issues of network management, and I think it should be replicated in other areas. So I think it is difficult for the agency to um, quickly resolve a lot of problems, and they need to rely on outside help. The problem is the outside help has often been like, you know, industry or stakeholder, because I don't want to take the public interest groups out of this, stakeholder thought and paid for research. And that just doesn't really contribute to a great debate. And I think there are things the agency can do uh, to get more objective data into its, into its proceedings. Um, Richard, I want to give you an opportunity before I do that. You know, Blair, I thought one of the interesting, and I want to ask you if it was useful, but it seemed interesting to me, process innovations you did in the broadband plan was you had these big group meetings and uh, bring together 12, 15, 20 people, uh, which we participated in some of them. I thought they were quite good. Uh, is there an opportunity, or is there a value of doing those, uh, building a little bit on what Judy said, building those kinds of things? I suppose it's very, sort of administrative law, legalistic thing that they have to do? Is there a way to supplement with things like that? Well, look, we, we did that in part because we had no choice. We didn't have time for a bunch of ex parte meetings, so we just said we're going to have group ex parte meetings. But I think it worked pretty well. I wish the commission had adopted it on a number of other things. I mean, we had a very clear process, which we actually set out at the beginning of the plan, saying here's how we're going to work it. We, we actually did this with the 96 Act, too, when we were under tremendous deadlines. So if you're, you know, if you have unlimited time, you'll take unlimited time. Some of you are told. Well, when it's, it's time expands to whatever, you know, work expands to whatever time you have. You know, if you always give yourself very short deadlines, you find much more creative ways of addressing these things. Um, Richard, anything you want to add to that before we move on? Yeah, I think the bottom line is that the interesting staff is doing lawyers and not enough engineers in the Congress. <laughs> That's pretty, that's, much that's, that's, that's pretty much true. That's pretty much true for everything, I think. Yeah. In the world. In the world. In the world. <laughs> and uh, oftentimes, too many economists. Uh. So, uh, all right. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. Well, let's. I want to drill down into, and I'm going to take total moderator prerogative here for a couple minutes to uh, to postulate what I think are the areas where there's probably the most amount of agreement. I think we have somewhat of a diverse panel. Oh, sorry industry-wide and ideologically. So I'm going to argue or suggest that I think we would probably have most agreement around adoption issues. Uh, I think that's an area where everybody agrees there's a role for government, reforming USF. Uh, I think everybody would generally agree around um, uh, that the, the PPP model gen tends to work and should be expanded, that there's a role for the bully pulpit, uh, and there's a role for smart subsidies and, and supports. Everybody sort of want to dispute that, that, there, that in, at least at some level there's, a, there's enough consensus there that it's something the FCC can move forward on? Uh, it, on you mentioned adoption, and I, you know, I guess I did, uh, I'll probably miss some of the specifics about uh, what people said about the government's role, but, but you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure. I think the, the providers have great incentives themselves to initiate programs to increase adoption. And I, and I would just be somewhat skeptical if, it, if, if by that we, we're talking about, I don't know whether we're talking about subsidies or again just the bullying pulpit, but that's, that's one thing I would, uh, you know, we just react to. And one, one point I just want to add because you mentioned universal service reform, and, and you know, I can just put this, I think, with a bluntly uh, or with a point on it. Right, and I know Blair has talked about this a lot recently. I, and they're having the Lifeline hearing today on the Hill, and for a long time, I mean, going back many, many years, my, I've been a supporter of the Lifeline program because I, I just think of it as a safety net for those that really need need support, you know, like some other safety net programs. But, and, and so I hope, you know, and definitely we need to uh, get it running in a way that, that tries to prevent as much fraud or abuse as possible. But it, I think it's important. And I see the Lifeline program, when, when it exists in, in, that, in a healthy form, as, a, as really a way to argue for and, and make the case that we, the, other, the high cost fund subsidies that are much less discriminant, uh, the way the program is run, should, could be cut back really substantially. So, 
you know, that, that's the what, that's my view on universal service is to, to put a, keep cutting back the uh, high cost fund over time uh, and maintain a lifeline program that works. Um, so, uh, on the one year anniversary of the plan, uh, I gave a speech on what I thought was our biggest mistake, on the, basically on the principle that after a year we ought to have an idea about what our biggest mistake was. And I think it was about adoption and it was totally my responsibility. I think we depended too much on the current model. Um, I would just make a couple of very quick observations. I think the commission did a good job in reforming Lifeline Link. I think it was necessary. But I actually don't think that that should be the driver. I think the real driver should be a combination of federal, state, and local governments understanding that to deliver great public services in the future, we need everybody on. And we need to reorient the way we think about education and healthcare and some other things that really drive the value proposition up. And that that is going to be, I mean, the, the reasons why people don't adopt, if you look at them, a lot of them are just because of the social networks that people have, and I mean that without reference to Facebook. And so what you really want to do is create an increased value. It's not so much about price, so that's up there. There are definitely some pricing issues. So it's really, I won't redo the speech now. I just think our fundamental way we're thinking about the problem is probably wrong. I think it's a debatable proposition. Uh, but I would like to explore kind of the government driving its, its own use. And then secondly, um, bully pulpit works for some things, other things it doesn't. And I, I think that um, one of my fears when I left the plan was that the, that the commission would think about uh, goals and aspirations more important than actual plans. And I think on adoption, when you, when you I think history will look back and say they, they essentially outsourced the adoption effort. Uh, again, a lot of um, praise to the private sector folks who participate and do this. But at the end of the day, this is a public problem, and there ought to be greater thought about how all kinds of programs that we're currently using can help shape it far more than simply utilizing the public pulpit. Got it. So, uh, Maybe echo a couple of points that I, I heard. Um, certainly, uh, I think Randy's right that the providers are, are certainly motivated to serve low-income customers. We certainly see that in the mobile broadband space where we see low-income customers choosing to access the internet through mobile devices where possible. So I guess I would pick up a point that, that Rick made, which is that when we do have universal service programs, we need to be sure to be careful that they're competitively and technologically neutral. So that you know, when we have government making choices about subsidies, um, those will reflect consumer patterns as opposed to having government make decisions about what types of service will be adopted. Um, to pick up a point that, that Glenn made about Lifeline, and this is maybe uh, you know, a little bit of praise for the FCC, one thing that the FCC is doing in 2013 is that they've established a series of pilot programs. These are time-limited, small-scale programs, but they've really sought to vary up the parameters of those programs, so they're gonna try to test for what is the right subsidy amount um, to what degree does digital literacy play a role? Um, you know, try to identify what are the barriers to having low-income consumers sign up to, to broadband and control for those. They're collecting more data as part of these pilot programs than I've seen the uh, FCC collect about universal service programs in a long time. So I think that could be a very fruitful effort. For I think what everybody's pointing out is that the really complexity of this problem is that it's a multi-pronged problem that requires comprehensive solutions. Can't just deal with cost. You have to deal with literacy. You need a literacy. You have to do with computer ownership. A lot of people don't have computers. Those who do have computers are much, you know, obviously much more likely to be adopters. So there's a role for for the government. There's a role for state and local governments in, in working on media, media literacy. Uh, Public-private partnerships has been an important thing, and I think proud of the cable industry has stepped up. Last year, the the cable industry's public-private partnerships connected to the Comcast equivalent brought in 150,000 new households um, because of this program of providing it at lower cost and helping provide the kind of support people need uh, to make it, you know, to make it work. So, um, you know, there's going to be, it's not going to be a simple effort. It's not going to be just about cost. It's going to take everybody sort of doing their part to make this happen. So with all due respect to Rick and, and the cable companies, I mean, Connect to Compete and the Comcast, you know, the low cost program, 150,000 people is not that much, and I think you know it's been well documented how difficult it's been 
to sign up low income uh, low income customers. I think it just gets comes back to Blair's uh, point is that this is you know this is about a value proposition and the data that I've seen just shows that a lot of folks just don't think there's anything for them online that they really even want to pay nine ninety nine a month for. And I'm not sure what the role of government is in fixing that. I mean, I actually took more over to sort of to Randy's side on that. Yeah, there's media literacy, there's computer access. There, there is a role for government, but I think it may be a little bit more limited uh, than we think. The bully pulpit is fine. Uh, I also don't think, again, I don't think the carriers can resolve it by themselves because it's a, it's a content problem, it's a social network problem. It's, 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 it's less about price, although price really has something to do with it, and more, as, as Blair says, about the value proposition. People don't, I mean, we're still talking about 30% of the population that doesn't have broadband. That's really significant, uh, and they just don't see that it's worth it. And it, it's a, a multi-headed hydra, and a lot of it just has to do with why should I be on there? There's nothing there that really interests me or nothing there that I need. It was government programs, if, you know, as or post offices closed down and places where you can pay parking tickets closed down. You know, that may be one place where, you know, government can sort of, yeah, you want your green stamps, you gotta go online to get them. Um, so government, you don't want to disenfranchise people, obviously, but so government can help in that regard. But I, I think it's a very, very complicated problem. And I'm not sure that government should have a huge role in it. Did you mean food stamps, do you? Food stamps, that I didn't mean food stamps. I, I, I collected green stamps. <laughs> <laughs> I do think on that point, I think where we would all agree is I, there's a lot of speculation about this problem and there, there have been some good studies, but I think one of the roles of the FCC is to really collect a lot better information, partly from these pilots, partly from it, get a much deeper handle on it. And yeah, we're not going to get it, we're not going to get that 30% up to down to zero, but could we, could we bring it down to say 20%? That would be a big step. Uh, I want to leave some time for uh, audience questions. Um, so I really only want to go to two other areas. Uh, one is spectrum, and then one is IP transition. Uh, on spectrum, I, I think there's probably pretty good agreement on incentive auctions and getting as much of that uh, into the broadband data world as possible. There's probably pretty good consensus on repurposing government spectrum. Uh, I guess the uh, area where there's going to be less consensus possibly is this is, is the PCAST report, the level of sharing, how much of that's realistic, uh, the unlicensed question, where how much should we stress? You know, I don't know that anybody on the panel would argue one <coughs> or zero on this. It's all licensed or all unlicensed, but it's sort of where you find that sweet spot. Uh, and then concentration issues as well. So, uh, you know, I don't know anybody wants to just jump in on that. We're not getting, not getting agreement on it, but are there some areas there where you think there could be some agreement on those issues? Why don't we start with uh, unlicensed? Well, let me talk about unlicensed. I mean, I think everybody probably in this room uses Wi Fi uh, <coughs> at home uh, and benefits from wireless, young, but there's, you know, everybody knows the story of unlicensed, how it was garbage spectrum and turned into some of the most innovative and productive spectrum that we have. Uh, the problem is that the existing Wi-Fi spectrum is getting congested. The primary band that's being used is the 2.4 gigahertz band. The cable industry uh, is rolling out this, many people don't know about it, but over the last couple of years, a massive uh, public Wi-Fi network in cities across the country. Um, right now, I think the number is around 150,000 hotspots. So if you go and look up on the uh, here in DC, look up the Comcast website, you can get a map of all the hotspots in downtown DC. And if you look in this area, you find they would be all over, uh, you know, all over outside. So if you're walking around, if you're a subscriber, you basically take your broadband with you when you go uh, for no extra charge. And and if you're somebody who's not a subscriber from out of town or something, you're not a subscriber, you can pay for, uh, for access right now. Um, that's a tremendous benefit, obviously, you know, for consumers who can have their Wi-Fi, their broadband with them. If 
you're a licensed subscriber, a licensed wireless user, you can maybe buy a cheaper data plan because you can offload a lot of that onto your Wi-Fi as you go. Uh, it's a benefit to the licensed wireless providers. That's why I think it, licensed and unlicensed not as being in conflict, but really being complementary because they don't have to build as many towers to the extent that a lot of the traffic gets offloaded onto Wi-Fi. It's also hugely been beneficial for you know, public safety reasons in the, in the, in the Boston uh, Marathon bombing, uh, Hurricane Sandy. Um, the Wi-Fi networks were open to anyone to use. And the beauty of Wi-Fi is that no matter if you subscribe or you have, a, you have the phone, is a Sprint phone or a Verizon phone or an AT&T phone or whoever, you've got a Wi-Fi chip in there. And so it's really sort of the de facto interoperable standard now. Um, so everybody could then use the Wi-Fi networks in, in an emergency. Um, the problem, as I said, is that it's, it's getting congested in many markets, especially the bigger ones like New York. Uh, it's getting very crowded, and we need more spectrum. Just like there's a licensed spectrum crunch, there's an unlicensed spectrum crunch. And all five commissioners recently recognized that, that there is this unlicensed spectrum crunch, and we need to find more spectrum. I know there's been a lot of focus. We can talk about you know, the broadcast band, but really the, right now the, the primary sort of um, place we're looking is the five gigahertz band. This is some of which has already been used for Wi-Fi, but we can only use a small sliver of it because there's all these government restrictions and other people mentioned government uses. There's government users and parts of it, but there's also just restrictions like indoor only use or low power levels, unnecessarily low power levels, and they get impossible to use Wi-Fi for in this band. And there's tremendous amounts of spectrum up there if we can make it usable. Um, and the real oh sorry. And the real benefit is the next generation of Wi-Fi will use that spectrum to provide one gig Wi-Fi. So if everybody's talking about one gig service, if you want one gig Wi-Fi, you really need to make this spectrum available uh, up in the five gigahertz band. The FCC recently put out a notice for both rulemaking. I'd love to see the next chairman focus on bringing that home and uh, working with NTIA and others, really, you know, lift the restrictions that make them possible to use for Wi-Fi, and that would really be a good benefit to, uh, to everybody. What Scott respond to that one? Sure. No, actually, um, you know, the CCI is taking the view that you need a balance between license and unlicensed spectrum. So, you know, I think um, uh, the FCC has been wise to pursue the 600 megahertz since the incident of auctions ban, which I think most think, uh, folks think will be predominantly used for a license. Um, also, pursuing 5 gigahertz, which Rick talked about for use in unlicensed. I think it's interesting that 3.5, the, the FCC has proposed uh, some alternatives. Could be used for unlicensed, could be used for licensed, could be some combination. So, you know, I think we think there needs to be um, a, a mix. I mean, I think, um, you know, when Blair and CTI first started talking about the spectrum crunch back in 2009, we were seeing the confluence of factors that were affecting licensed spectrum. And I jotted down just a couple of statistics so we could told me like two minutes for what we saw in 2009 versus what's happening today as of 2012. Because I don't think that even we at CTI fully guessed what was going to happen. Um, so back in 2009, um, anyone know how many LTE subscribers there were? Pretty darn close to zero. The, the two are pretty close. Um, so today, 32 million LTE subscribers. We lead the world. We've got more than the rest of the world combined in terms of 4G LTE subscribers. Um, uh, uh, smartphones. Um, there were 40 million smartphones in 2009. Today, there are more than 150 million smartphones. Um, tablets. Anyone remember uh, the iPad in 2009? That's right, because it, it hadn't been launched yet. Was launched in April of 2010. So today there are over 20 million tablets on US carrier networks. Just talking about license spectrum. Um, applications, we looked at the apps market. It's a new market back in 2009. There 150,000 apps out there. Today, you want to guess? 3.6 million apps um, out there today. So, um, you know, it's really it's incredible how that hockey stick in usage has, um, has, has accelerated. So, you know, when Rob asks about sharing, you know, we certainly think studying sharing makes sense, but you need to make sure to continue to focus on clearing the spectrum. Um, and that's going to continue to be a goal for us. Um, you asked about spectrum aggregation concentration. Everyone probably knows that's a tough issue for us, but it members with different, different views. But I think if you meet those goals that the National Broadband Plan delivered, if you're bringing three megahertz or 300 megahertz of spectrum to market, 
a lot of those issues start to solve themselves. So I want to move one last issue, and I, I can transition, and it's a, perhaps a little bit like Spectrum in the sense of uh, there's probably nobody on the panel, I'm going to assume, who thinks that moving to an all IP network, we would take every single rule in the copper network and put it there. There's probably nobody who would say there shouldn't be any rules. So there's something about what rules do we bring forward and what rules do we medicine and leave aside. Uh, how close are we to any kind of consensus on this? Gigi, you want to start on? I actually think we're kind of close. I mean, I think it's a little too early to be talking about rules. So we've been talking about fundamental values I think if we can get agreement on that, and it's interesting, I will boast a little bit, public knowledge came out with his five fundamentals, and then Commissioner Rosenworcel has her fundamentals, and Commissioner Pai has his fundamentals, and I think it's great. I mean, I think it's really a conversation starter. So let me just throw out our five <coughs> fundamentals. Again, we're not talking about any specific rules, and I would agree with you. And number one, I think we need to make it clear we're very excited about the IP transition. Okay, We don't think we have to stick with copper. Uh, but at the same time, you know, these values that have underlined our communication system for 100 years, and, and we think that they need to be ported over. So very quickly, service to all Americans. I don't want to say universal service, because I think that's broad. Uh, interconnection, competition, consumer protection, public safety, and reliability. So I think that's, that's a conversation we need to start to have before we talk about, OK, what rules are we porting over? You know, how are we going to you know, embody these values and regulation maybe differently than we've done, you know, over the past 50 years or so. So I think that's the place to start. Right. Richard, you want to jump in on that? We're working on an IP transition report. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I pretty much agree with, uh, with uh, most of the GG's list. The, uh, it's interesting the way that you think about that we want to think about reliability, however, in the, in the IP world, is that different than the way we thought about it in the, in the POTS world, where rather than having uh, these sort of bulletproof hardened networks that can withstand any sort of natural or man-made disaster, uh, we get our reliability in the IP world to redundancy. So if we have more than one network connection, then then the individual network connections don't have to be uh, nearly as reliable as the telephone network is. And also the, uh, the interconnection and some of these other principles, they sort of reflect the fact that uh, in, the, in the telephone world, where everything was built around the, the idea of a single provider, and it was a heavily subsidized system where, in fact, I think the tail wags the dog in the universal service concept for uh, telephone which is that we, we've given up, we, from the very beginning, we gave up on the, on the possibility of market competition in the densely populated areas that actually could have supported it because we uh, were, I think, probably over-concerned about providing service to the rural areas where there's really not ever going to be much of a market uh, for a, a wireline service, although I think we can potentially have market competition for uh, wireless broadband in rural areas. So let's not let the rural, the needs of the rural areas dictate the overall policy framework for uh, IP, both mobile and, and uh, fixed IP networks going forward. Right, thank you. Randy, Ms. Blair. Uh, you know, well, I'll Well, I was going to say, uh, listening to Gigi's list, that, that uh, you know, I think, I mean, obviously, sort of at a values level, that there can be a lot of it. Agreement, and uh, I, I do agree. But when you the rubber hits the road when you get down to implementation, and I think on interconnection, for example, uh, I mean to me that this this is going to be an area. Richard just touched on it, where where it's it's a uh, difficult but important issue, and where the F, where there, I think you know if by interconnection you were to mean and, and maybe. Maybe you don't. That, that essentially, we're we're importing the same type of obligation with the same type of FCC authority uh, under the current uh, the current regime. Then I think that would be wrong on, on the other, and, and not the appropriate way to go. On the other hand, it, it does seem I've always thought that sort of interconnection, uh, the the obligation to interconnect, uh, you know, was. Is, is pretty fundamental, but I so I think in the 
and this is where the IP tr trials, I think, can be useful. Uh, but it seems to me that, that we want to be careful not to do, you know, this, the 201 same type of interconnection obligation from the, the analog world. And one way to do this, to, one way to think about it, uh, you know, that's short of traditional FCC authority that was exercised. You earlier mentioned the multi-stakeholder process, for example. And, and you know, maybe this is an area where there can be some type of multi-stakeholder process as a, a backstop the rest of, you know, to resolve disputes that just otherwise can't be disputed. Perhaps there's some process that doesn't, that again, doesn't involve the FCC mandates. But I, I do think it's, it, you know, it's going to be important to try and develop something that, a world in which interconnection is, is hopefully facilitated, but not, not not regulated in the same way that it's regulated now. Well, Blair, uh, the last comment, I want to go to the audience. Uh, I would just say about the IP transition, you know, sometimes I'm introduced as having written broadband plan, which is totally false. I wrote almost nothing. Actually, there, there, this comes out of one page in the broadband plan. It was the only page that I actually typed on, um, because it turned out, actually it was Paul DeSaul and I just got together one afternoon and just kind of did it and then revised it, because it didn't fit anywhere else, which was kind of interesting institutionally. But the one thing that I got out of it is that I hope that the government very quickly comes to some um, timetable where it says to the current carriers, here is the data in which we will no longer force you to invest in obsolete network. It's not tomorrow. You can pick three years, you can pick five years, you can pick seven years. And, and I actually wish the commission had started this process right after the plan because I think that's a very important date. In the same way that the digital television date certain ending was very important. And I might note that when we did the digital television transition, that, that's, that's how we got the spectrum where what Scott's talking about was made available. We had no idea um, that it would be used for that. But we certainly had faith that, um, that you have to set deadlines just as Congress had given us some deadlines. So I would say it's really important to get to that date as quickly as possible. And then all these other things, whether they be interconnection, and I think that's a really tricky problem, uh, or the kinds of things Gigi is talking about. My final point is, cities are way ahead of the federal government in doing this. Actually, if you look at the um, uh, some of the things between Seattle and a company called David Square, or Kansas City and Google, they are effectively rewriting the social contract in, in a way in which, and Richard earlier on talked about the original deal being monopoly in exchange for universal service. That's no longer a viable deal. So we're redoing this. I'm not saying the cities are getting 100% right. I am saying that these are a series of, I think, very useful experiments for how to approach the problem differently. Yeah, and I, if I could just say something about the trials. I'm not sure why we need trials, <coughs> particularly if the purpose of trials is to set the default that, you know, no regulation. Um, you know, there may be good technological reasons. I guess I haven't heard AT&T articulate them. I think if I hear them articulate why they really need to have trials uh, in this sort of regulatory-free zone, uh, I'd be I'd be interested in hearing it. The other thing on interconnection, I don't think we need to port everything over, but I do think a basic obligation to interconnect, uh, I think, is critically important. I mean, imagine if AT&T and Comcast have a battle one day, and an AT&T customers don't get comp you know don't get traffic from Comcast customers, and vice versa. I mean, do we have to wait for that to happen uh, before we just have a baseline rule of the road that says you have an obligation to interconnect with other networks? Okay, want to open it up for, want to ask a question or make a comment, uh, just raise your hand, identify yourself. Uh, Mike Nelson, the Bloomberg government. <laughs> want to thank you for organizing this outstanding panel, particularly one that just left water from my office. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could have watched it online, Mike. I could. But um, you, you covered the status quo scenario. You've taken the issues that are on the table now. I'd like you to look at some of the game changers, some of the unexpected things that could happen. You mentioned the court case. It could cause a lot of problems. But another game changer could be a, a massive cyber attack on the telephone network. Not on the AP Twitter, but on the core network. The FCC hasn't done a lot of cybersecurity, and we've spent a whole hour without talking about cybersecurity, which 
hasn't happened in the last three months. So what are the game changers? What are the things that really throw the wrench in the process? What could really force rapid change lead to a firestorm? And do you think cybersecurity might be something that the SEC is forced to do? Anybody on from any big unexpected <laughs> thing, good or bad? Yeah, I think there is certainly a kind of piece of issues that we discover as more people cut the cord on telephone service and uh, rely on IP in, in the sense that the structure of the internet protocols, TCP IP and, and even the, the telephony protocol, SIP and voice over IP depends on for making connections. These protocols were not really designed to be as resilient or as secure as we would, would really like them to be if we were sitting down with a blank sheet of paper and designing the internet today. I don't think we would really design it the way that it the way that it currently currently is. And so there there is going to have to be uh, an ongoing great deal of engineering work done to sort of bring uh, IP up to the level of uh, resiliency and security that we're going to need when it becomes you know, the, the single technology that we're completely invested in for everything that we do in, in telecommunications. And it's kind of unfortunate that, you know, internet's research was designed to be a research network and to be used by a trust community of researchers that uh, is behavior to be controlled really by social means, not by technological means, and now it's open to everyone. So, uh, you know, it, it is used by criminals and stuff to tax our issue. I'm not really sure that that's really an FTC issue, though. I mean, we, we seem to understand that the way you deal with cyber attacks is by information sharing between the affected networks, but, you know, we're kind of hung up on the, all on the privacy implication of allowing network operators to share the information with each other that they need to effectively respond to cyber attacks. I mean, dealing with attacks is something which is a normal daily occurrence. There are hundreds of uh, attacks a day, and network operators deal with them effectively, but they deal with them by coordinating with each other because they, they have relationships uh, with their peers that, that operate other networks. Uh, okay. Thanks. I want to keep moving on. Any quick comments on So here's my quick list. A digital Pearl Harbor, which I don't think the FCC is well addressed to deal with. A privacy Pearl Harbor, which is probably for FTC. Uh, an unthinkable merger. I actually would have thought at and T Mobile was unthinkable. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But there are certain mergers I can think of that I won't go into that might be game changers. I think wireless undercutting uh, USF uh, in rural America is going to cause a really curious crisis. Um, and it may not be in the next couple of years, but it's definitely coming down the road. And then finally, I would just note the Aereo case, some, um, as a result of it, some networks have suggested they might effectively stop broadcasting. Uh, and I think that could cause a, um, I'm not saying that that's going to happen, I think it's a bluff, but I could be wrong, and if certainly there are some people on Wall Street who think that would actually be the right economic strategy. Uh, if they were to do that, that would undercut a very long tradition of um, network local affiliate broadcasting. What is the issue? Pearl Harbor. Oh, as a cyber attack. Like, oh, if they do that, Blair, can we get the spectrum back to free? Uh, look, I, if I were to charge that, I would have said, go ahead, make my day. <laughs> yeah, the, the but broadcaster I, didn't get the reaction they wanted when they threatened. It was like, fantastic, yeah. give your spectrum back. <laughs> I would have said that na another natural disaster like Hurricane Sandy started to, you know, show where the problems were. Uh, particularly with the reliability of IP communications, as Richard said. We have something more like that in, during the Boston uh, Marathon bombing. Uh, there were problems with uh, cell phone service as well. So that could be a game changer. I already said that area case is a game changer. But I, I think what's going to happen is the broadcasters are going to run to Capitol Hill and try to get a fix and make my day. That will be a great day for public knowledge uh, and its allies because I think it's going to be very hard to explain to consumers why they shouldn't be able to use the service, which essentially is an antenna service that they rent. So, um, we'll, we'll go next right after, 
uh, we should a year from now go back and look at everybody and see if anybody, if there was something we all missed. I always remember this great uh, Alvin Toffler book that he wrote in 1994, The Famous Futurist, about the future. And the word internet was not mentioned in the book. Uh, and home shopping on the television was mentioned <laughs> quite significantly. So Still even, survive, huh? even great futurists have a hard time predicting the future. Uh, any other, anybody else want to just jump in? Yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, my name's Will Reinhardt. I'm uh, actually at Tech Freedom, which is, uh, my colleagues actually helped put together the, uh, the coalition that you're suggesting. And I actually kind of wanted to push back on that a little bit because you seem to suggest, or um, I don't know, maybe I, maybe I heard you a little bit incorrectly, but you seem to suggest that you want the agency to function better and you worry that humility would, or driving specifically for humility, take away from that. And it doesn't seem to me that there's necessarily a difference between Market, like understanding the markets work very, very well, and then also saying, well, yeah, clearly the agency needs reforms and deadlines and internal review processes. So I was wondering if you could spell that a little more. Well, yeah, look, this is going to be the headline story today. <laughs> I'm, I'm opposed to humility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That's um, not a headline. That's a problem. But I'm, but I'm humble about it. Look, I, I work on Wall Street. I don't believe in humility. I do believe in hedging which is the Wall Street's version of humility, right? I mean, um, which is why I like both unlicensed and licensed. But look, I, I've worked in a lot of different institutions, almost all of them private. Every effective leader I've ever known does have a shadow of doubt, but they also are very effective at articulating where they think they need to go. And I go to, I go to Rick's point, uh, which is, I, this is not about regulation deregulation. This is about leadership. And so for me, the question, you were writing a letter, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm kind of kidding about it, because look, again, I work for who I thought was a very effective head of the FCC. Would you put humility in the top 10? No, I don't know. Anyway, but, but part of the reason <laughs> he was effective, it was, the part of the reason he was effective was he had a very clear sense of mission. He had tremendous backbone. Um, we were wrong, and we had talked about places we were wrong. But we were, you know, he, you didn't know what he thought the day of the meeting where they adopted it. You always knew what he thought 90 days before. And I think that's a character of leadership that I think is really important. And I, one of the things, and this kind of goes to what you were saying about the, the processes that we use, I think it's really important to put ideas out there. And then you let people shoot at them. And then you adjust. But humility is not the first character that I would look for, first characteristic I would look for. I would look for a mission group. And we can argue about the mission, but if you're mission driven, you'll be effective. And if, if you're a weather vane, you won't be. I mean, just to push back on that, that's kind of the, that was the purpose of the letter, was exactly that, that the mission should be humility about the role of markets within, within this overall conversation, which oftentimes seems to blend out. Well, you're there. making a substantive point, which we could argue about, but I, I um, as to one's position about the, the market, there are certain things, getting networks everywhere, getting everybody on, using them better in the public sector. Uh, and I think innovation is an important thing. I think those are things where there was a government role. The question of defining it well, you know. Yeah. Randy? Uh, Blair, Blair and I have had this conversation quite a bit recently over the last couple of years. But, and here's the way I would put it. It relates to your, your, your letter as well. What, what I would say is needed. The, you know, there's a lot of talk uh, often about data-driven processes and the commission has to be data-driven and I don't want to be quoted, I don't want the headline to be Randy May is against data because I'm not, but I'm not, but but I think that that can be overdone and, and, and it'd be a trap in this sense. I think what the next, we need a chairman and an FCC who recognizes that at this point in the development of the communications marketplace, and you just have to observe it, that, that it's obviously increasingly competitive. Gigi and I might differ, I'm sure, on the degree of competitiveness in particular markets, but I don't think she would say we're not living in a marketplace that's increasingly competitive. And when that's the case, the way I would put it, because humility doesn't necessarily say exactly, the, doesn't put it the way I would put it, is that the, there has to be a, there ought to be a, a mindset that presumes that the default position, when it's not, when there's not otherwise clear evidence that markets uh, are concentrated and that you need regulation, uh, the default position should be don't 
regulate. But I, and I think that's consistent, really, with, with, with your intent. So it may be that there's a, two, a four cell matrix here with uh, humility and, and uh, arrogance and the trust markets, trust government, and those inflating those two things. You could have something that would very, shall we say, the opposite of humble, but wants to be regulated. And so it's, I think, the earlier point is that some of our fog is more just about leadership and vision and just the same thing. Uh, so I'm going to close, but before I do that, I want to ask everybody in no more than 45 seconds just to give a closing sort of, uh, you're now speaking, the, the, the new chairperson is sitting right there. You've got 45 seconds to say something to him or her. Uh, what would you say? Anybody wants to volunteer for that point? Everybody's thinking it. Uh, all right, put you on the <laughs> Hire great staff and, and but empower them to uh, actually lead and, and really be out there and focus on not what, focus on the 10 years, not on tomorrow's con daily. You have huge opportunities in front of you. The agency has fallen into near irrelevance and has lost the faith of the American people. Use your leadership, define your mission quickly, and bring the agency back to its prominence. Uh, so maybe I, I think I would end where I started, which is, you know, you have an opportunity here to continue to drive jobs, to drive innovation, and the way to do that is to implement what is a bipartisan view on bringing more spectrum to the market. I would make that a, a top priority. Uh, yeah, I would just say, uh, you know, at the practical level, apart from the philosophical, just concentrate, uh, you know, like a, a laser to coin a phrase on initially on, on implementing uh, the spectrum auctions. Uh, and I didn't have a chance to say this earlier, I would say, it that should be done without uh, exclusions and conditions, but, but really to have a clean auction. And then secondly, uh, you know, to keep moving ahead the IP, uh, you know, transition. Uh, and Blair's idea about setting the deadline is, is really excellent, I think. I think just empower the staff uh, and focus on not things that are working well out there in the marketplace. Broadband market is generally strong and, and competitive, uh, but on those things where the FCC really has expertise and where it has a clear role, such as bringing more spectrum in the market, especially as I said before, the unlicensed spectrum market, and focusing on things like adoption and, uh, and sticking with the what the broadband plan laid out to to players credit um, the technological and competitive neutrality of that fund. Thank you. All right, Richard, last word. I don't want to sound cynical about this, but, but in, a, in a non cynical way, I would, I would tell the FCC chair that success in tech policy always depends on figuring out what's already happening and take the credit for it. <laughs> and so I would encourage them to establish uh, two or three fairly lofty goals, uh, one of which would probably be uh, let's have 95% adoption of smartphones uh, all across America. Another one would be let's uh, mm. limit over the air television and encourage 95% adoption of uh, the of some sort of fixed broadband in, in the home uh, as a goal. And uh, let's see what we can do to sort of increase the public awareness of the benefits of IP networks, both fixed and mobile, uh, so that people really have the, have the motivation to, to really uh, Appreciate the value. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I hope that uh, whoever is going to be chair um, has broadband in his computer literate so that they can, uh, <laughs> they can log on to the, uh, the ITI URL and watch this video because I, I think they, whoever that person is and whatever sort of ideological slant they have, whatever humility score they have, uh, I think they would do uh, quite well to listen to this wonderful group of experts we just heard from today. So please uh, join me in thanking them and thank you for you all attending.